I'd say the escarpment is probably going back about, it must be at least 15 metres, probably closer to 18 metres down south. And that's just in the last three years, I guess. So what's the difference between talking about the crisis of the crisis in the abstract to seeing it in a particular place and how do you connect the one to the other? So the issue that we're confronting here uh, is a relation between the crisis of crisis as it's been discussed in the abstract and then coming to a place where there is a crisis that do actually directly connects to the crisis of crisis but it's in no way immediately apparent to anybody seeing that crisis that it is connected so you know the question to kind of try to answer is how do we make the connection so just to kind of reiterate, the crisis of crisis, in essence, uh, is the fact that there is a crisis and is it a compound crisis. It isn't just one crisis, it is the relation to a whole series of crises that doesn't arrive as in anything like a relational complex form. So all that happens is a particular events occur which are critical and they arrive, get reported on, get discussed and so on. So the crisis in its full nature and seriousness remains invisible. Now when we come to a specific, particular place and the place that we've come to uh, is Bruni Island and Broody Island has a very thin strip dividing the north and the south of the island. And that strip, you know, is being subjected to erosion at an alarming rate. And at some point, the north and the south and the island are going to get separated. And this particular problem isn't a problem simply for Bruni Island. It is a problem that's happening at various rates around the world. So, the situation is, it is perfectly possible with some explanation to get somebody to comprehend that there is a crisis of soil erosion or the erosion of the beach uh, at this particular kind of location. Uh, but when you stand on the beach looking at the problem, you're just kind of seeing one moment of that problem. You don't gain any impression of the magnitude of that problem. You don't realise that metres and metres have actually been lost over a period of just one, two, three, four years. So uh, you, have the, um, you have the reverse problem. The crisis of the crisis doesn't arrive at the specific location of a crisis because there is no kind of discourse, there's no annunciation, there is no connection. 
to the crisis. But it does have a potential. It does have a potential to kind of unfold an explanation of crisis. So how does that go? Well, it goes a bit like this. That the reason why there is a sort of dramatic rate of erosion is because the climate is changing. The way the climate change occurs at this particular kind of location is the combination of more extreme weather events, more storms, uh, of greater violence, and the slow progression of a rising sea. Uh, now, all of this is on a, particularly, a particular trajectory of really increased magnitude. So although the loss has been great over a considerable number of years, in the future it is going to be greater for the reasons I've just explained. But we're still a long way from the compound crisis. So to take the actual things that are occurring and put them into the larger frame. Uh, so we have sea level rises illustrated by one particular instance in this particular place. But those sea level rises are occurring everywhere at an increasing rate as are uh, extreme weather events. Those events are not just obviously related to the sea, they are also related to all sorts of other events, including fires, including heat, that means people have to abandon land because it is impossible for their location to be tolerated at the kind of the temperatures that are arriving. Likewise, the sea uh, isn't just going to rise and erode beaches, it is actually going to destroy the possibility of people existing in many coastal cities, particularly in areas uh, that are already suffering from other environmental problems caused by development. For example, the destruction of mangroves. Uh, generally, the construction of buildings on the sides of hills where you're increasing water running into into rivers, uh, into, into estuaries. So that's a situation where uh, tidal surges become even more critical and even more dangerous. So all of these things converge on one particular kind of consequence, the displacement of human populations. So now we've got these problems compounding together, but it doesn't stop there. Because as soon as you have large numbers of peoples who are being displaced, they've got to go somewhere. And we're not just talking about a few people, we're talking about millions, tens of millions of people around the world over coming decades. And that causes an enormous problem for those places where they arrive, because they're going to go to other cities looking for somewhere to live, looking for jobs. Uh, so that has the potential to create civil unrest. Equally, those people are going to want to go to other places that look more promising in terms of a viable future, which is going to mean that they're going to want to cross borders. So that then creates condition of conflict. So we've suddenly gone from Bruni and a one beach along one particular geographic uh, feature to a kind of a global problem extending over decades. So to come back to the crisis and crisis and to the condition of perception, uh, the person, for example, who takes their dog for a walk along that beach every morning doesn't have a global picture of the crisis of crisis, but they don't have a, a, a local picture either. You know, they might be concerned about the erosion of the beach, 
they might be aware that that's a problem related to climate change, but they don't extrapolate that further to the relational complexity of what happens when you have all of these crises combining and creating a crisis of crisis. So they're kind of, from what I've been saying, there are kind of two immediate issues that become apparent. The first one is the place is not seen and felt and understood as, as just an isolated place. It is part of the fabric of the entire island. Uh, it, it is something to which people have a relation. Uh, it, it is something that has a particular kind of history. So place uh, and its significance uh, becomes something which spills over into, as it were, the psychology of the location, the emotional dimension of the location. But this kind of connects to the second point, which is really the relation of our being to the climate. Now, really and truly the empirical presentation of the crisis of climate change is only half the story. We only actually get introduced to one dimension when there are actually two. Let me put it this way. If I pose the question, how do we know about climate? A lot of people would then come back with all the kind of data that they picked up. They would report what they've seen or read about changing conditions or the kind of data that's created by climate scientists. So people know about climate change through that data but they also have a kind of an existential relation to it and we have an existential relation to climate but that existential relation is absolutely critical in our ability to make sense and to deal with that data so if you ask somebody to explain in the abstract hot or cold you know, what they will actually do is to try to describe how they feel in relation to hot and cold they won't try to explain it scientifically uh, because you can't know hot and cold scientifically you can only know it experientially uh, so in relation to climate change, you know, what people are doing all the time is kind of bringing what they encounter as data, what they encounter as information, what they encounter as news to their own experience. So they're kind of not necessarily doing this in an explicit way, but they're trying to, in a sense, validate or verify information at an experiential level but there is no kind of information really being provided that addresses it at that experiential level and why it's so important for that to happen is because we have to be able to respond to the situation not just scientifically not just by taking environmental measures that attempt to mitigate the problem, we also need to be addressing our own relation to it, our own sense of it, our own feelings towards it, our own recognition that we have to learn how to adapt to the situation that is changing, that was always a part of 
of our species relation to climate because we are a product of climate adaptation. Now, over the course of the existence of our species, mostly those changes have happened in a graduated way. Occasionally, they've happened in an accelerated way. And that's what has happened in the present by means that aren't natural, but means that are being generated by our own human activities. We've caused that process of change to accelerate. Now, the problem now uh, is that we don't have the ability in an evolutionary sense to, to slowly adapt because the events are moving too quickly. In other words, there is an imperative for everybody who, who is being exposed to environmental circumstances which are changing to understand that those changes are going to increase the impacts are going to intensify. Therefore, the question of, of how to adapt to that situation has to be part of the conversation. And that might mean you know, physically changing how you live, what you do. So you try to stay where you are, but adapt to the change, or it might mean you're going to have to go somewhere else. So I'm suggesting to link back to the crisis of crisis, the very fact that the crisis is being dominantly presented to us scientifically and being ignored existentially is actually part of that crisis. Now, of course, a problem immediately arises. The problem is that some people are in a better position to adapt than others. Or that condition to privilege, privilege certain kinds of adaptation. Um, you know, again, what is very clear is that those with wealth and power are going to try to provide a situation for themselves uh, through an increased use an application of technology. So they're going to, in a sense, try to increase the protective capability of the places where they live and work. Uh, to be at the opposite end of the scale, socioeconomically, means uh, the, the whole process of adaptation is going to be totally different. But this has been intrinsic to the history of humanity. The fact that we wear clothes is part of the process of adoption. The, the fact that in wearing clothes they change according to the season is a manifestation of adaptation. So as the climate changes, our relation to clothes have to change. The structures that we built to live in were a response to the particular climate of place. But the changing climate would suggest that what we previously built becomes inappropriate, that we have to actually conceive a more appropriate way of structures to that changing climate, not just at the given moment, but thought of in terms of time. But then we have the problem of all those things that already exist, the whole fabric of the city. And the demand there uh, is to retrofit those environments so they can adapt. So the whole domain of adaption, the whole domain of existential responses to a changing climate is really an enormous area 
of exploration and development that when you really start to explore it without diminishing the significance of scientific inquiry is in terms of complexity and demand greater than it. One last thing to add, you know, all, all of this has an enormous kind of psychological impact and a growing psychological impact. You know, to live somewhere and to see your environment, you know, gradually disappearing, gradually eroding, gradually being destroyed, you know, has a psychological consequence. Uh, it is unsettling. Now, that isn't going to be experienced uniformly. It's going to be experienced differentially with different people. So, again, that becomes part of the complexity. Because our response to climate is always psychological. How people feel changes according to the climate and the weather. You know, I've got a friend who works in Sweden who kind of dreads the kind of long winters of almost continual darkness. But psychologically, that affects that entire population. So, you know, structurally, in kind of northern Scandinavia, there's been a traditional problem with alcoholism through depression, through living through that experience. Uh, likewise, kind of the way in which people have tried to talk about geoengineering, you know, being introduced as a way of reducing global warming, uh, is very ambiguous because one of the consequences by putting particles, metallic or ice, uh, into the atmosphere is the phenomenon of the sky being blue disappears and, and to live in a condition of a permanently grey sky again would have very significant psychological consequences. So I'm just bringing this back into the picture of the experiential and now the psychological really being absent from the discussion um, and all I've done is kind of touched on it very lightly you know it is much more substantial than I've indicated and there is a kind of a real need for more people to kind of realize this and for it to be actually taken far more seriously as an area of research.